way, this is a sort of companion video to the one about ammonia-based life, but obviously because it's a big science video, I'm not actually gonna go off. If you're interested, you can click on there and it will take you there and you'll have a look. Anyway, ammonia is a very important chemical. It's got a lot of uses. It's used for making fertilizer. It's also used for transporting hydrogen because the hydrogen can be packaged in ammonia, which is easier to liquefy and then it's moved around. It can be used as a raw material eventually for making nylon and polyurethane and it can also be used to make explosives. The other use it has is as a refrigerant which is more of a physical use. What it does is it does something similar to CFCs in fridges where it evaporates and pulls the heat away from the substance. It is also an ozone depleting gas also like CFCs so that's quite interesting. But it was until about 150 years ago, or maybe a little bit less than that, rather difficult to produce in large quantities. Then, along came a chemist called Fritz Haber. Now, I want to talk about him in a minute because he's got rather an interesting life and he's quite an interesting person. But before I do that, I want to talk about the Haber process, or rather the Haber Bosch process of um, producing ammonia. Now, the production of ammonia is an endothermic reaction. That is, it makes it, it has to, it absorbs heat. The production is actually looks like that. So you've got your scribbles, you've got your nitrogen there, nitrogen gas, and you add it to hydrogen gas, three times the quantity of hydrogen because it's three, three hydrogens per nitrogen. And you pass it through the process and you get like um, ammonia coming out the other end. So that's how it happens. However, it's not really that simple because what actually happens is this. Firstly, you've got to get your hydrogen from somewhere and a common source of hydrogen is natural gas, which is largely methane. So you extract the hydrogen from that by whatever method. Then you place it in a chamber with an atmospheric nitrogen. And you have to get the quantities right, obviously, otherwise you won't end up with ammonia you'll end up with something else I don't exactly know what I haven't really thought about it you then pressurize it to 200 atmospheres because this makes the reaction quicker and you use a catalyst now a catalyst is a substance which doesn't take part directly in a reaction but speeds up a reaction and you heat it to 450 degrees centigrade because it's an endothermic reaction it's a reaction that uses up heat if you didn't do that other reactions would occur and this illustrates an important point about endothermia and ectothermia which is this if you have a fairly high likelihood of endothermic and ectothermic reactions happening in a mixture if you raise the temperature it reduces the likelihood that the ectothermic reaction will happen and it increases the likelihood that the endothermic reaction will happen if you don't know what endothermic and exothermic mean I mean exothermic I think I said exothermic look here and there's a video explaining that. So you heat it to 450 degrees centigrade, put it under about 200 atmospheres of pressure. So that's the pressure that you get, um, let me think, um, about a mile and a half, about two kilometers down in the sea, more than a mile and a half, um, about two kilometers down in the sea. Um, and then you get ammonia, but you don't get ammonia immediately. And what you have to do is condense that ammonia. So you get liquid ammonia and you sort of take that off then put it back into the cycle and you make more. Now, the reason this reaction is so important is because it enables fertilizer to be produced. And if fertilizer wasn't produced, the current farming techniques would only be able to support two thirds of the population that they actually support. So in a sense, it's quite important, but it does have a number of negative reactions. When you make fertilizer, it has to have nitrogen in it because nitrogen is required for protein and other things, for example, DNA synthesis. And that fertilizer, when it leaves the farms, when it leaves the, the soil, it can go into water and that water will then be fertilized and algae, algal blooms will develop. And those algal blooms can be blue-green algae rather than plants, which can be poisonous. That happened at a reservoir near here called Cropston Reservoir a few years ago and uh, it was very undesirable because it was extremely poisonous. Uh, but algal blooms possibly not a good thing anyway because they cut the light out um, and they create imbalances in the ecosystem. Now, there are, just to talk about Fritz Haber for a moment. Fritz Haber 
as well as being the person who invented the Harbour process, was also instrumental in developing explosives for the Germans, because he was German, I think, um, during the First World War. And he extended the length of the First World War because he was able to produce those explosives. He was also a pioneer in the production of poison gas in warfare. So he was the father of chemical warfare. And in fact, his wife committed suicide because of that, because she was opposed to it. Then his son found the body, but he left for the Eastern Front to, and not on conscription either, in order to supervise the release of poison gas. On the day his son found his wife's body, and years later, his son also committed suicide for the same reason. He was also involved in the company that developed the gas used in the gas chambers to exterminate the Jews. And he was himself Jewish. So in fact, many of his family were actually killed in the gas chambers, partly as a result of the kind of things he was doing, because he developed poison uh, gas. He didn't develop Suclon B, uh, but he did develop the idea of poison gas. Although he did also say that the French used prussic acid in the First World War on the Western Front, so he's not entirely innocent. And of course, the British are responsible for the invention of concentration camps. So that's all very balanced. But what always puzzles me about ammonia production is this. This thing here, which I'm going to tilt so much that it'll probably spit out. There it is. My wee wee. If you leave that for long enough, it will turn into ammonia. It's urea, urobilin, uric acid, and all that sort of stuff at the moment. But after a while, if you leave it for long enough, and it doesn't actually take that long, it takes a couple of weeks, it will start turning into ammonia. And at that point, it becomes very acrid and nasty, obviously, but also very useful. Now, what I don't understand is why people don't collect, simply collect urine. urine. They did used to do this and distill it because it's giving off loads of ammonia after a short while. And in fact, on a low level scale, on the local scale, you would easily be able to use that. And in fact, we do use it. We've got compost tape in the back garden that I was gonna show you, uh, but I haven't, um, which has got a load of that stuff in it. And yeah, we do use it. Uh, just on the subject of fertilizer though, fertilizer is usually NPK fertilizer. That is, it has phosphates, nitrogen, and potassium in it. Now the point about that is, that's not all the essential minerals that are needed for plants. So what fertilizers tend to do is throw plants out of balance chemically and you will get fewer of a certain nutrient and more of another nutrient. Another thing that throws plants out of balance, by the way, is the greenhouse effect because of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But I don't want to talk about it here because that's not what we're talking about at the moment. So that's the Harbour process. Harbour was not a nice person, I don't think, although he was probably typical of his time. He was also Jewish, which was a good thing and interesting because it shows you how much contribution the Jews make to society because he did, obviously, he fed a third of the world. But on the other hand, he also killed a lot of people in, indirectly and didn't seem to care very much about his family. And in any case, on a small scale at least, it is possible to make your own ammonia really easily. In fact, it's in a sense difficult not to make your own ammonia. So, there you go. Now, if you like this video, please rate, comment, share and subscribe. If you dislike it, tell me why so I can improve. And I'm trying to improve the sound quality, by the way, by doing this. So it should be quite loud, although there's probably a bit of a clinking sound on the clothes and that. Um, if you dislike it, please tell me why so I can improve. And I'll see you tomorrow.